afternoon or good morning my friends this is Rick and I am Rick and this is your seat at the table you know I'm trying to get smoother on those things and some desires are better than others this is the first of the new year it is uh, supposed to be a great snow day I'm doing a series of videos so you're likely if you see some of the other videos in a couple of weeks down the road I'm telling you it's the first that you understand that that's obviously thing so we're looking at the periphery here and the periphery has always been a fan favorite and a favorite of mine it's also something that's a bit convoluted and uh not always as well established in game canon as other places for good reasons but at the same time that's also makes it for an excellent location to play the game to play your scenarios and and on a smaller scale so you don't have to be overwhelmed by the possible potential of all these other bigger great houses and all this stuff that goes with them uh, they, but they've done some pretty good stuff this is the original periphery uh, circa 3025 series and then they come out uh, after the Clone Wars uh, or excuse me the, the the clan war breaks out invasion and we get an updated version of the periphery and instead of this just being a carbon reprint of this this is actually an updated version it still shows and has a lot of the same material basics in here but it brings it in you know 30 years later uh, up to date kind of stuff then there's a third book called explore core or, or something I have that book and it is deep periphery and over time we're going to get all this and while the great house books basically be, that's one of the reasons they were the huge behemoth hour-long videos that they were because they are a large entity with a lot to uh, cover and uh, the periphery states not so much and I, I wanted to do a little more in-depth on each one individually as I could and so we're going to tar start with the Tarian Concordat uh, which is an interesting case because it's probably the, considered the most the strongest of the periphery states and the, from the the idea of the periphery or the frontier uh, brings a lot of different mixed opinions and feelings to the different people and different players and things like this and some people have some misconceptions and those misconceptions in my mind are perpetrated all the time and pushed as that these guys or whatever so it's interesting to know it's interesting to know that Three of the of the current periphery states houses are consistent from pre Star League era. They were settled before the reunification wars, before the formation of the Star League, and or grew during those eras. Uh, as a matter of fact, the Turian Concordat is actually the oldest established house house in inner sphere and out. It predates the establishment of the Terran Concordat, the uh, House Calderon predates House Merrick. You know, the Federated uh, the, uh, Free Worlds League is a better part of 800 years old, and so is the Terran Concordat by a little bit, little bit margin of error. Another misconception on some of these things is that they're that they're basically trumped up bandit kingdoms, and once again, that's that's being disingenuous. In a lot of aspects, if you were to break down, and I pick on the Federated Sons a lot because I like it, uh, it, it is uh, if you break down the Federated Sons into its into its key components, what do you have? You have three minor houses working together, more or less, hand to hand, on a big agenda. So you have the Day Beyonds of the Crucius March, and you have the Hassocks of uh, the Compellans March, and you have uh, the Sandovals of the Draconis March. And those are individual houses, and if you break down, so if, you know, they only have 100 plus systems and settled planets, you know, the, the Federated Sons as a whole has 400 plus, almost 500 systems and planets and settled, etc. But you break it down by those three core, you know, minor houses within the house. The, the political bodies that cause uh, economic and political bodies that cause no end of strife and conflict and issue amongst themselves and to their first lord and vice versa. Uh, the periphery states are put right in there, and they're just as comparable. As a matter of fact, they 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 have enough manpower, resources, economics, and other stuff to allow them to impact on and influence to some degree uh, the politics and economics and things how things in the inner sphere are going to go. Another reason that the periphery states themselves have never been overwhelmed or just simply taken over by another house is what they they tip they, they call it in here the piranha effect. And what that suggests is is that the the, the the Magistrate Canopus or the the the, uh, uh, 
the Turian Concordat, uh, military sufficiently su su strong enough to repel or defend against a concentrated attack from a neighboring house, House, house Merrick or House Leal, perhaps, uh, for a limited duration sufficiently limited uh, to make it long enough to give the other houses an opportunity to take advantage of and to attack that house that's attacking the Terrans. Not because of some alliance or something, it's just that uh, they perceived weakness. So even as vast as, and we and I was, we talked about that in every one of the, the core book uh, videos I've done, each house has its own strengths and weaknesses. So House Day Beyond, once again, uh, has its sheer size. And while it has the most potent, effective, and perhaps the largest military uh, un, uh, uh, organization of all the houses, it's still handicapped by distance economics. And the possibility that, the, that they have to, because of that distance, they have to cover so much, they have to protect so much border, that if they take, an, they take a percentage, they just take 5% of their strike, their, their, their offensive, defensive ability from the, 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 the Draconis Combine's border and move it to uh, strike at House Leal, then it invites an, an attack from House Karita, who's going to pretend, or one of their warlords, to look to exploit the weakness. That was a crucial element for the lead up to the Fourth Succession War. Uh, the reason that has, that that uh, Federated Science and Hans, Hans de Beyond's people were so successful at, at conquering and dividing and and uh, reducing the threat of, of uh, the Compelling Confederation uh, for a number of decades was not because uh, they were not just because they were very good at what they did and they were well supported and it was well planned out, but because they were able to remove crucial units from the Draconis Combine borders and ship them across the house and pre-position them and then support them into this compelling uh, campaign. One of the reasons why the, the three uh, other houses, when House Diner and House Davion formed a pact, the other three had to quote, form a pack of defense, too, was the idea that House Creta should have attacked into the uh, Day Beyond space as soon as they found out that the Day Beyond went on the offensive against the Compellents in force. And it would have been easier for the Caridans to accomplish that and taken worlds and resources away from the House Day Beyond had they been doing that. But political bodies and unrelated er, uh, uh, situations interfered, i.e. the Wolf Stragoons feud with elements within House Creta. This stymied the, the, the chance of opportunity against a weakened uh, the Federated Sun's border in that region. The other key element was Hans Davion convinced Steiner, uh, Katrina Steiner that it was this, this invasion and, 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 and uh, containment of the Confederation was, was very necessary for any six future succession of the Federated or the uh, FedCom Alliance because uh, to, uh, for a number of reasons politically economic and militarily speaking but she he was he convinced her because he needed their house the steiner's uh military forces to engage the Koreans on their side of the border and uh the Kore uh, the steiners were very reluctant to do this at first in part because well this put lie to what katrina steiner had been saying for 25 years that she'd been trying to find a peaceful coexistence of these houses she wasn't looking to be a warmonger uh, or even support the idea but she was brought around board and convinced and eventually that's just what they did and with help and training from uh, the AFFS the Laren Commonwealth Military actually did a crack job and uh, at the beginning especially in the beginning and then they start falling back on some of their old behavior, uh, behaviors and habits uh, as the fourth succession were progressed but they were still able to have considerable inroads into uh, the Cronus Combine and uh, on that border, which forced the elements, uh, the other half of the elements in uh, the Draconis Combine, who were not obsessed with Wolf Dragoon situation, to counter, counter, uh, defend, and then counterattack the Laren Commonwealth. Um, and then, of course, the irony, if you know your politics, is that all majority of those gains made uh, were then turned around and handed over to the Free uh, Razagul. And I know I'm mispronouncing that kind of that nation, that that uh, new house nation state that was formed. Uh, so a lot of the kind of in a way, uh, there's a lot of Steiner, uh, alert, uh, Commonwealth uh, people and leadership that are soured by how this all played out. And they have some grounds. They have some grounds. They 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 were 
making great successes against the Draconis Combine, only to give them a good chunk of them back. And we're not talking later after the cl the clans invade and basically take all of it back and take all of it away from them anyhow. So we're looking at the, the Turian Concordat. So we got the history. They, they're, I'm talking about the Piranha Principle and the death of a premier, the Terran Alliance, the first Exodus. So a lot of these periphery uh, houses were established uh, because they were fed up or uh, driven out of Intersphere prior to the, uh, the Starlet. And when they, they just decided they'd had enough and they were going to travel out and go do their build. Uh, so uh, the Calderon expedition is an example of that. See, among many of the thousands fleeing post-war outer reaches was a young woman named Samantha Calderon, formerly the planet of blah, blah, blah. Having lost her husband and two daughters in the Alliance firing squad of late 2236, she found herself an heir to a vast financial fortune based on an immense terraforming concern that her husband had found on a vega. Between 2238-2245, however, the loss of numerous Calderon merchantmen to American free traders, i.e. privateers operating under letters of marquee, coupled with the collapse of financial Natural markets throughout the inner uh, outer reaches drained away more than half her wealth. Uh, believing only radical sol solution was possible, she converted the remainder of her funds into calf drive ships and supplies, announcing her intentions to mount a major expedition beyond the reaches of the known space. In 2250, 25 FTL ships and over 2300 volunteers uh, departed, avoiding contact with the World's Alliance. The Calderon flotilla barely uh, briefly made at port at Robinson, Victoria, and New Citrus for departing known space. After a journey of some 22 months, the Calderon expedition reached the edge of the unexplored Hades cluster and surrounded by a dense nebula of gas and dust. The Hades zone was still something of a mystery, even in the 23rd century. Every exploratory craft sent into the nebula had without exception, banished without a trace, nearing the Hades for the first time, etc., etc. So, you know, the the SLDF exodus that eventually brings the, brings the clans back to the inner sphere is not the first time that this sort of stuff happened. And a lot of the current borders of the Feder or of the inner sphere today were considered the, the outer reaches and the frontier, the periphery of the, those earlier centuries. So, <clears throat> That's one of the ways that, so basically the Calderon, Cal, Samantha Calderon leads a bunch of people. She finds a, a very secluded location, very far from the, the at, as at that time borders. You know, if you've read or heard anything about the, the, the stories for the, the clan or the uh, SLDF Exodus and the trials and tribulations that uh, Kerensky's people endured and suffered during that nearly year and a half to two year ver uh, uh, trip, you get an idea that you know, 22 months trapped on these drop ships and jump ships, they had the same kind of problems. Anyway, they found the location to set up their 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 colony, and eventually it uh, it succeeds. So the inner sphere politics, the Turian Concordat. Far removed from the dynastic ambitions of the inner sphere, politicians, the preferences, isolated pockets of humanity went about their daily lives. On Taurus, the death of Samantha Calderon led to the selection of her only son, Timothy, as the new protector of the Turian home, uh, home world in 2268. Despising the democratic process that smacked of the hatred of the Terran alliance, the new ruler dis dis uh, decided to establish hereditary rulership instead. Armed with sweeping powers, Timothy called around established an ordered culture based on simple social egalitarianism, i.e. no work, no food. Those who did not contribute to the general warfare were in turn denied access to the common welfare. Though curious and even quaint, Timothy's social political theories provided just the emphasis the Terrians needed to expand and prosper. So, a, a common meme, a common meme of uh, when we talk about the Torian Concordat, and I love texts, I love them, hippity hop, they get off my property, uh, and these references to uh, Space Texas. <laughs> I'm telling you right now, my friends, I've been to Texas, I understand Texas, I got family in Texas, and while that independent mindset and uh, uh, self-preservation, et cetera, et cetera, uh, drive that they often attribute to uh, the Turing Concordat's uh, ability or uh, strength as one of their strengths is, while true, they're, and you can't even put any, there's no state in the United States that ever could be compared to the 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 Torian Concordia. you just there isn't now there's some mindsets and there's people and stuff now maybe some aspects uh 
you know, Mormon Utah might have some uh, common ground there, a lot more common ground than let's say uh, frickin' uh, Texas did. Uh, also, uh, maybe Norway or or Iceland. Ben, ben, uh, I'm thinking maybe sweet, uh, maybe switch a little bit, maybe not. So basically, the concept of the Turing Concordat is everybody contributes. You know, not unlike uh, let's say Israel, where you reach a certain age, you you are you are mandated to serve X amount of years in the service of your country. So you either join the military or one of the other government body uh, organizations to earn that right. Uh, all the people, the politicians, the nobility, everybody, they rule under the understanding that the people come first. The welfare of the people come first. You are constitutionally guaranteed a living wage. You are guaranteed access to health care. You are guaranteed a retirement and a decent one. You are guaranteed the rights and liberties and everything that pertains thereof. And this is guaranteed by every level of the, of the government period, and defended by the military, period. This makes them a some sort of uh, hybrid social socialism kind of thing, right? You want to eat, you work. You work and you contribute, the state will look after you and take care of you. And you're entitled to have a decent this, and a decent life, and so on and so forth. And you're entitled to do pretty much whatever you want, as long as it doesn't interfere with everybody else's right to do the same thing. Just saying, we can learn a lot from this. And there's a lot of people who are going to shake their fists and be upset by the fact that I just threw, I don't know, I just took a big wet uh, dump on uh, a lot of people's view of the Torian Concordia. And I don't think by any means, say it's based Texas, have we doing any kind of justice for these people whatsoever. And like I said, I like the, the Concordia. I have done a lot of, of campaigns and stuff based in it and around it and from it because it's just it's a great place to play and so most of this is preludes to the uh, you know the, 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 the years before the success uh, the SDL, SLDF the years after the SDL so on and so forth that's another thing that always always kind of irked me the arrogance and the self-centeredness of the SL you know the Star League leadership uh, the Camerons especially when the whole point of the reunification war was basically when they went out to these smaller countries, these smaller states, and, and houses and said, look, join us or die. You will be part of us, and that's all there is to it. You come willingly or you come kicking and screaming, but you're going to. Now, and this sets off a, a, a decades-long conflict. Uh, as a matter of fact, the longest, most vicious part of all those all those reunification co uh, conflicts was with the Turian Concordat. It lasted damn near 22 years. One in five Turians died defending their rights to do what they wanted and their belief in their system. And then their system did not handle, the, when the SDL uh, people took over and uh, the Star League uh, administrators and stuff tried to conform uh, the Turian Concordiat's uh, policies and beliefs and things to uh, represent how they felt it should be run, uh, the systems didn't work well. And they never did. And as soon as the opportunity came to throw the yoke of the SLDF off, they jumped on it with full feet. Hence the hippity hoppy part, in my opinion. That's just my opinion. By all means, you don't think so? You know, make some comments. I'll have a I'll have a great, a great spirited debate with anybody. You want to you want to make some comments? Let's do some business. So they fought some brutal stuff here. This is typical. This is the stuff. This is to the knife, to the bone. We're gonna fight you on the asteroids in space. We're gonna fight you on the side of the ship. We're gonna fight you in the bottom of the ocean. We're gonna fight you everywhere you go. Any place you want, we're gonna take you on. And if we lose, then we lose. But by God, you knew you got into a fight. That was a philosophy I had for many, many years when I was a young man. I did. I realized early on that I'm. I was at the time. I was six two and two hundred and thirty pounds. I was a big dude, and I had a lot of people that wanted to pick on me or I thought I don't know what they thought. And I was also a pretty jovial dude and quiet dude, and I and I, and I a bombastic dude on opposite days of the week, depending on what the scenario was, and a very highly opinionated one who occasionally put my foot in my mouth and had some people want to check me. Then. I remember one situation, guys, I'm going to kill you. And I looked him straight up, and he had like three of his friends there. And I says, I'll tell you what, win or lose, they're going to pry my jaw and find a chunk of your ass in it. 
So you want to you want to play? Bring it down. We're gonna we're gonna dance, and one of us is going to the hospital, and me and Mike both go to the hospital. Either way, you're gonna know you had a fight, and that's the way it went. And surprisingly enough, I never got bothered after that in high school and stuff. I mean, I really, really think I I startled some people because I I was I I had an uncle who taught my cousins and I basically there's no such thing as a fair fight. And I was determined to win this fight, and chairs flew, and trash cans flew, and bodies slammed into doors, and uh, people ran screaming down the hallway, and I got two, year, two weeks of suspension. But it was the sheer brutality of this. You know, it was a bad WWE day. <laughs> How you want to look at it? So, anyway, let's get to we'll move down here to the actual section on, on Cordat. Lots of information, lots of stuff leading up. So we could do we could do lots of videos on a lot of different things in here that lead up to all this stuff and various intimates. I mean, we could have a whole, we'll talk about the console affair. Claimed your rights to section in 2650 at the age of 25. Made in speech before the Star League Council, she acknowledged that she had been coming to a majority five years before. She lacked administrative lo logistic uh, legislative skills to rule effectively. She acknowledged her debt of gratitude to her uncle Carlos, etc., etc. Right. Canopian triplets, Nicola takes over, crucial year, the seduction of Richard Cameron in a video by itself, in the amorous situation. Right. Divide and conquer, the succession wars, first succession wars, the bandit kingdom, second succession war, the conclusion. And these are the these are the succession wars from the, the periphery's perspective. All right, so here we got the Turian Concordat. Out of the many states of preference, the Turian Concordat maintains a closer resemblance to a successor state. Under the direction of the House, Calderon, the highly independent Turians have a strong central government, high literacy rate, and a strong military. They appear, appear to be the preference community most likely to survive the next century, as well as becoming a leader in the preference affairs, even an influential one on the inner sphere. Now, let's be honest here, they've been saying this sort of thing probably better part of 600 years. Now, the Turian, the periphery states have the same problems that the houses do on some aspects. This, the big crucial one is the lack of FTL transportation. There just isn't enough jump ships to go around. If, and I've done previous videos on this, if the Federated Suns maybe only has three or 400 jump ships, period, total, well, an outfit like the Turian Concordat has what, 20, 25 at best? And that's supporting both their military and their economics, their, their, their merchant traffic, traders, all this. Maybe a dozen or so free traders added in there. There just isn't sufficient amount of material, uh, 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 resources to do a lot of long distance exploration and colonization. Although of all the states, inner sphere and, and, and periphery, the Turians, with assistance from the Canopans, actually make some attempts at doing this. We'll, we'll get into that a little bit here. Uh, but the, the uh, uh, it's just, the second limitation is, once again, uh, logistics and supply. You just can't supply these colonies, and then you can't protect and defend them unless you have sufficient military forces and, and, and the resources to support them. So it's not conducive to just keep ex this never-ending expansion. You just can't. And then eventually you run into other entities who've already settled certain systems and planets, and they don't want to be part of your concordat or your inner sphere. Uh, house and they will fight you and we're back to that. Can you support it? Can you maintain the uh, the, the, the conflict, etc, etc. So the Turian Concord began as a desperate venture into the unexplored space of the Hades Cluster. Uh, goes on, goes on, and goes on. Uh, the last two centuries, however, the Turians have had to defend themselves against foreign invasion of, from another part of space. Between the clashes from the Magistry of Canopus over disputed border worlds, as well as incursions by renegade mercenary units and pirates, the Concord has made, obliged to maintain a large and efficient military. The rise of the Farlookers, a philosophical set advocating the exploration of space beyond its charted limits, the Concordat has expanded its borders, settling worlds beyond the notice of the rapacious inner sphere. Comstar is unsure of how many worlds they have been settled so far, although we can be sure that none of them are sufficiently developed to be incorporated into the Concordat itself. This this supports what I've said in all the major houses. When they talk about this house, Davion has almost 500 settled planets. But that's the official recognized worlds that qualify as part of, you know, the house. 
but how many other colonies and operations exist both in the inner sphere and beyond the inner sphere that are supported by individuals or private organizations or, or governments, uh, elements of the governments, uh, the elements of various nobility with, that don't qualify as a tax-paying uh, uh, legitimate house. So, you know, I'm just saying, what, what, is, what is the limits on that sort of thing? So, all right, so sphere of influence, the Concordat contains over 30 inhabited planets in a zone roughly 80 parsecs in diameter. Uh, the terrains also control a variety of small outposts extending an arc from the edge of the magistrate Knopus to the largest system of the Federated Suns. In the late 2900s, the terrains have resumed space exploration, resulting in the founding of several new colony worlds. Uh, social political structure. The Concord is a collection of the representative democracies coupled with a constitution of monarchy, similar in some ways to the House of on Federated Sons arrangement. The hereditary protectorship of the House called her against an, a grants an anatomy, autonomy to individual member worlds. Charged with promoting the general welfare of the Concordat, the protector of the realm maintains the supreme cola con Concordat military establishment. So the structure is the protectorship, the Privy Council, Ministry of Defense, various other ministries and government agencies, the Concordat courts and Concordat functionaries, internal politics. By law, the con a Concordat government guarantees a free and open society, individual rights, and the general welfare of its citizens. All citizens can move freely within the Concordat without needs for passes or work permits, and individuals can pursue their own economic and social goals without regulation. In turn for government-sponsored education and protection, Concordat citizens must serve in some capacity to defend their state for a period of four years. Beyond this obligation, Turian citizens are free to lead their lives as they please. Planetary governments may adopt the form of representation they deem appropriate, as long as each maintains a viable working allegiance to the protector and the Concordat. Political goals. Primary goal of the Concord is to preserve the independence and safety of the individual. Concordat citizen beyond this, protector of the realm, is also concerned with the expansion of the Turian state through colonization the edges of periphery rather than at the expanse of his neighbors. Although attempting to maintain a peaceful interstellar relations, Concordat leaders view renewed hostilities as a real possibility. Thus, a strong military is a major priority with what they perceive as continued security of the Concordat. So, again, interstellar relations, compelling confederation, federated sons. These are the two countries, that the, uh, great houses, that the, has had the most impact on the Concordat in, uh, in history. And it followed up by their neighbor, the, ma the magistrate of Canopus. And we got uh, the Turian nobility. Turian nobility is bestowed on individuals who render special services to the state i.e. the Turian people rather than the government. Many noble nobilities are hereditary, but while some nobles achieve recognition in areas of education and administration, all titles reflect the notion that aristocrats must serve the people they command. Nobles have few material advantages compared to their inner sphere counterparts, a condition unique to the Concordat social structure. This mirrors a Torian uh, social concept that an enlightened aristocracy provides the greatest good to the greatest number. Specific titles are similar to those used in the successor states. So let's talk about the strengths and the weaknesses, right? The Concord has a strong central government backed by service-oriented nobility concerned with the welfare of its citizens. Concerned with the average Joe and Jane citizen. Their position is to make sure everybody has a chance to live a good life, prosper, be taken care of, eat, etc. Period. That is not a space Texas ever, let alone a space America or USA ever. So take that to your take that and eat that, you memers. Uh, the greatest stre strength of the Concord it may be a dedication to the government, showing the ensuring individual rights, being so the shrewd short-term benefits of police state, law and order, exemplified government structure in favor of greater creativity and productivity productivity of people allowed to follow their own inclinations. Indeed, this may be the greatest single reason for the Concord it continues to be growing. Healthy entity despite the depredations of sex wars. In light of this, the uneasiness that many Torians feel about the growing power of the Concordat constabulary is still understandable. The Concordat government has taken on problems that it might have avoided, however. The other side of the exploration for issue, for example, it is that it's a gamble. Although the potential of new colonies may eventually bring greater wealth for the Torian people and a greater power to the government, Concordat may be overextending itself, creating an indefensible borders, expanding and spending enormous sums on colonies that may never play out. See, 
uh, that went back to that. It, it, it's one thing to expand and to settle new worlds. It's another to be able to protect them and to keep them from being wiped out or exploited or uh, or whatever by somebody other than your people. Uh, in all, the Turians are playing a dangerous game. Their con continued growth can one day make them a new superpower, but also makes them more tempting target in the here and now. A religion and philosophy, all forms of religious and philosophical expressions are tolerated within the Concordat, reflecting centuries of tradition and popular precedent. Unique to the Concordat, however, is the official support of a state religion, deism, in keeping with many social trappings of the Terran age of reason that Turians have adopted. Although no citizen is forced to belong to the Turian, Turian deist church, and indeed many question the point of even having a deist church at all, the institution receives the government support and can boast uh, the largest following of any religious persuasion in the Concordat. Last century, two philosophical creeds, the bar lookers and the inheritors, have gained prominence in the Concordat. Both owe their growth to the Calderon family, and both seek to establish a pragmatic approach to daily life in a periphery. The creed of the bar lookers suggests that life in a periphery should not be static as it had been. The original founders of periphery states and settled the Concordat, so too the bar lookers insist should the contemporary Turians explore worlds the edge of known space, i.e., keep, keep exploring and settling new worlds, whether you can defend them or not. The inheritors, on the other hand, believe that they're destined to return to the inner sphere after the inner sphere crushes itself. There's actually kind of a, a, a clan, kind of a view like the clans have, just a little bit, except by except of taking the inner sphere by force. The, they go back, and as liberators, these guys go back as uh, healers and, and uh, renovators. Uh, military forces, uniforms, ranks, and so on and so forth. Structure of the Turian Defense Force, Army, Navy, Medical Division, various uh, corps and military units. Deployment of TDF forces. Following the breakdown of the current disposition, armed forces and direction of the Turian Concordat as of 3025. Uh, blah, blah. Where does it say it's in more? Special forces. All right. Following summarizes three wings of the TDF Special Forces, Concordat Constabulary, the Turian ASF, and the Noble Family Regiments. Concordat Constabulary is a dual function local defense force charged with intelligence gathering and internal security operations. It is also a source of conventionally armed troops in time of war. Uh, in addition, the Constabulary retains the service of Special Engineer Company on each planet outside the Hades Cluster. These individuals are charged with maintaining planetary defenses and fortifications. All constabulary units maintain at least one company of armor in the capital of each inhabited world. The Tentorian Special Asteroid Support Force is a body of 5,000 soldiers and naval personnel trained on zero-g defense platforms throughout the Hades Cluster asteroid belt. So not only is the the core of the Turian uh, homeworlds inside a cluster, or inside a, a, a cluster, the cluster's got a layer of asteroids before you got to get through before you can get to the habitable zone. And these fine folks have figured out a way to turn that into a deadly shooting gallery, uh, which makes invading very, very, very costly and, and questionably difficult to do. And then each individual uh, noble family is required in event of the war, of war uh, expected to raise and equip local defense regiments at their own expense. The, high, the number of qualities, quote, home guards cannot be estimated at this time, but their strength and reunification were suggested possibly one to two dozen such units, ranging from a thousand to three thousand conventional troops. So, yet another way to bring more firepower and bodies to the conflict in, in a time of need. So, they're pretty decent. Uh, weapon industries. The Turians are capable of producing thunderbolts, warhammers, marauders, hatchetmen, locusts, wasps, battle mechs, lightnings, thunderbird, and aerospace fighters, leopard class dropships, personal weapons, and small arms, uh, sail uh, sailors, class aerospace, hunter class tanks, union class dropships, uh, Vandenberg uh, mechanized industries you can produce the archer, stinger, marauder, hunter tanks, Chippewa aerospace fighters. Thunderbolts, Warhammers, Vendette tanks, artillery ordnance and munitions, Stinger, Commando, Griffin, Union Class. For a, for a small a small quote, periphery backwater, these folks who produce pretty much AWEC, every category but assault so far. Every you know, they, they don't have the means to produce assault mechs that I that I've noticed anywhere in here. 
uh, let's just say they don't, but they can produce a reasonable amount of light, medium, and heavy warship or uh, mechs and and medium light, medium light uh, starfighters and uh, a collection of, of drop ships on a regular basis. That's impressive. So not only can they produce these things brand new, but they produce the components and materials to maintain and support the ones they have, which allows their military units to be fairly robust and well maintained. A crucial thing, important. So we got to, in addition to that, they also maintain their own academies. Loan of all the periphery states, the training concord at large military training academies. Present there is one academy for each major combat branch, Army, Navy, and Aerospace. Uh, so that, that, this is another tool that allows their military to be successful and well well equipped because they're well trained and the training continues. The strengths and weaknesses. On the whole, the Turian military consists of highly trained and well motivated individuals. It nevertheless suffers from several debilitating uh, factors. The, 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 yeah, my, I know my pronunciation issues got a little bit of a little bit of dyslexia going on. The shrunken size of Concordia in comparison to the original holdings of the 2500s means that in any full school war, a full scale war, the Turians will be unable to trade space for time as they did in the reunification war. Then the first they saw a few months of fighting, the Turians can expect to lose several key systems, after which they will force either a desperate counterattack or withdraw into the cluster itself. Many Turians key industrial loca uh, centers located outside the Haiti zone marking the prime targets for occupation. Protection of these manufacturing centers forces Turians to commit most of their battalions to relatively static roles. Culture and the arts. The Concordia has retained the highest literacy rate of the periphery. Indeed, the Turian education system has served as a model for other states, including those in the inner sphere. The Concordia government has traditionally given the educational system high priority. During the reunification, where many Tarians largest educational institute, blah, blah, blah. So, once again, one of those key weaknesses and, and strengths and weaknesses. We've established in, in the, the videos on House De, uh, Devon, uh, Devon and Leha and, and Free Worlds League uh, and, and their opponents' combine, especially, and to some degree, the, the, the Learned Commonwealth, education is hit or miss. If you have access to wealth and money, or you're on a certain capital world regions, your access to education is fairly robust. Uh, like in the Federated Sons, they've only got a handful of, of, of central systems where education opportunities are high. Majority of the worlds that are in the are in the Federated Sons, on the other hand, it's hit or miss, and the resources are not applied. The military takes a big chunk of the government's uh, budget, so the fact is, like in real world analogs, education takes it takes one in the backside on a regular basis, which is detrimental to a healthy a healthy people, a healthy country, and a healthy economy. I mean, if, if you have decently educated people who are informed and make good decisions because they're informed and have the means to not only uh, have a decent education, which allows them to potentially have a decent job, but allow them to further that, that, that education without burying themselves in debt, which is a problem in our country today, in my personal opinion. And these people have, this is an example that's not Space Texas, not Space USA. As a matter of fact, so progressive are the, uh, the Turians about their education system that it is considered the best, period, in and out of the, uh, 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 anywhere in uh, uh, the inner sphere and out. Uh, a number, like the, the, the House Davion, for example, actually uh, imports teachers and, and uh, education ideas and concepts from the Concordat, where the, the uh, they don't like to acknowledge it above board, but they do. It's in their, it's in the books, and it, is, and it makes sense, right? It's like uh, so one of the Turians' uh, greatest strengths and exports is its education and its ability to educate other. So how many, how many well-heeled, you know, low-level aristocrats have sent their children to Concordat universities because they they, they couldn't get them into the ones at home. And how many people went on their own or benefited from education materials coming from the Concordat and teachers from the Concordat. And this education system is almost unbroken. It goes back and predates the Starling. 
It's better part of 800 years old, a highly established education system. That's impressive. That's impressive. It's like in the, the Magistrate of Canopus. The Magistrate of Canopus, the education system is kind of lackadaisical a little bit, like most of the others, where it surpasses and is superior to anybody else in, in and out of the inner sphere. It's in the medical area. Their medical doctors, their medicine, their, uh, their research scientists, all this stuff are the best in and out of the inner sphere. As a matter of fact, that is one of their ways of making money is that they have medical ships to go and travel around and, and offer stuff that a lot of the people within the houses, well-established, quote, economic powerhouses, don't, are, are not able to acquire, or, or in the case of places like the Draconis Combine, or, uh, or more, in more greater detail, uh, the Federated Sons, there just isn't enough to go around. So the fact that these, these medical uh, uh, core outfits come out and operate, it's just like their entertainment system the Canopians. So the Turians is this education thing. So they have their military rivals any other military in the inner sphere. And probably on a one-on-one, -on -one, unit by unit basis can go head to head with the Federated Sons AFFS and hold their own. Out of numbers, they're at a disadvantage so they just don't have the numbers, but they don't have an invasion mindset. The Turians have never in their history ever intentionally invaded another person. They've never went after another house's planet or territory. Matter of fact, they've not really made a, a concerted effort to go back and recapture the original ones they had prior to the rene reunification war and, and the depredations of the Compellons or the frickin' uh, the House Davion. What they did was is moved outward. Defend what we have, move outward. Find places that nobody has a claim to because then we're not disputing it. We're not trying to take stuff from you. You know, they, they, they try hard to walk that walk where their neighbors are, you know, a lot of that going on in our world today, by far, once again, reinforces my argument that they are not Space Texas. Sorry, Space Texas. I don't know where the hell you're at, but you're not in, metal, you're, you're not in uh, the Battletech universe. Not ever, right? So... Culture and arts, viewing a lar as largely, uh, largely the servant of the people, the Turian government has traditionally refrained from censoring its media, even in time of war. Throughout the Concordat, individuals retain the right to free expression without threat of government intervention, as long as the expression cannot be proven libelous. libelous. The average Turian uh, can expect free medical care, old age pensions, and a living allowance. There's also a guaranteed death benefits to surviving family members to the, uh, at the government's expense. Like most free societies throughout history, the Turian Concordat has been inconsistent about producing major artists. One generation may see a flowering of great visual artists, followed by a generation of great writers. Currently, there's a renaissance of novels producing. Okay, so a couple of these fine, great websites. You know, Grim Dark Nar Narrator. There's a great series of Battletech lore sites. If you want to see stuff, you know, it's not quite on the, the text level, but, you know, who is? But he's got some great stuff, and uh, yet some of it, his interpretation of what he reads, I don't agree necessarily that he's interpreting it completely. And he's interpreted that you know their great one of their greatest cultural uh, contributions is the the written word, literary works and books, which is true. But if you read the actual wording here, it says that the current crop, their current strength in culture, cultural. Uh, 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 contributions to humanity in general are in the written format at this moment, but that's because it's the current thing. I mean, it goes up and down according to this. So, uh, the current currently there's renaissance of novelists. Unlike such artistic trans, uh, Turian novelists are not part of a single movement, but have divided themselves into two camps: the realists and the futurists. Realists ab uh, advocate instantly the same principles that each other movement in the past, where the futurists tend to be more symbolic representations of realistic situations, <coughs> some which are almost hallucinatic in their intensity. Debates surrounding these two schools, the writing has spread to the literary as far away as New Avalon, entries in the Outworlds Alliance. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Social economics. 
The Turian Concord uh, government has traditionally maintained a laissez-faire uh, approach to monetary policies. The government sponsors institutions such as the Bank of Taurus, the Concord Mint, and the Turian Treasury Reserve do exist within Turian space. They serve only to remind, uh, maintain the stability of the monetary system. The government intervenes only when unusual circumstances threaten runaway inflation, economic recession. Much of Concordia's private sector operates on a profit motive, but with curious limitations. Through trade is encouraged with periphery neighbors, Turians have drastically curtailed their trade with the successor states, viewing such trade as politically undesirable. Consequently, Turians often suffer from a lack of venture capital and, uh, and for investing in local industry. Despite this, the renewed colonization among the edges of the uh, periphery by the government and private concerns may yield new raw material. So, it's, it's established in here, too, that greed's good as long as everybody gets paid. Uh, the corporations and making profit, the government's not going to regulate them to death. They're not going to make a bunch of mandates that you have to do this and that with a few, a few curious exceptions. One being is your employer, your employees are entitled by law to a livable wage and health care and a retirement. You are not entitled, the CEO and owners of these corporations are not entitled by law to get 90% of the profits to maintain slave labor and subpar standards. And if you want to find yourself not operating in the Concordat as a, as a uh, economic entity, <coughs> keep that up. They will put you in your place and you will not be in business because that's not how they're going to tolerate it. So we got corporate profile, personalities, Thomas Calderon, a brief atlas in various worlds. So we talk about, well, the periphery is just a backwater, you know, frontier, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so here, you know, New Vandenberg, for example, class star, class B of Comstar facility has a, has a population of 1.3 billion. That's a billion with a B population. Well, the, the, Tourists, the capital of the, of the Concordat, has 2.1 billion, B, as in B, billion population. That's pretty respectable for some frontier hick town. Just saying. Next to the turn, yeah, uh, New Vandenberg is the most important world of Concordia, the site of better fighting and reunification war. According to the Turians, long established permanent garrison by President New Vandenberg supports a population of well over a billion, the largest Turian war material industry outside the Hades cluster. In addition, the planet is known for its rich variety of rare and exotic avian life forms, many of which remain in protected and nature preserves in the planet's southern hemisphere. So we go through, and then of course we have some, you know, here's one with 15 million, and here's one with 55,000. You know, Britain, Comstar Facility C, roughly 55,000 population. 50,000 trained technicians as specials. Britain's a cool temperate world lying in the triangle zone between the outer edge of the Turing Concord Gap and the Compelling Confederation. Major electronics manufacturing production center. Water world is a tempting target for opportunities. Been raided and sacked many times at the beginning of succession wars. Combat raising tide of enemy attacks. Britain maintains a standing contingent to battle. Met companies supported by a battalion of well trained local militia at all times. There are also several large Turian warships guarding the approaches to the Britain system. And I think this was predated because, you know, nobody had warships until recently. So, uh, you know, unless they're applying to war, i.e., warship dropship kind of thing. All right. It says here, although the Britain government freely trades its goods with individual commercial concer concerns outside the Concordat, they maintain a strict quota on the number of foreigners permitted on the planet at any given time. Anyone who violates these restrictions is assumed to be either a spy or a saboteur and is treated accordingly. Such restrictions also apply to members of Comstar, which are only 100 members of our blessed order allowed to be on the planet at any given time. See? Concord, them Turians are kind of savvy people. I'm more savvier than a bunch of hillbilly uh, uh, frontier, uh, uh, you know, uh, freaking uh, pelt hunters, like some people like to say. You know, New Ganymede, 112,000. Strope has uh, 78 million. There's another decent sized planet with a large population. All right. So, I was in the Turian Concordat where we talk about the way the Concordat operates and does its things, 
it, it's important to know that they are con very progressive in promoting internal uh, success for their people, and making sure everybody has a health, healthy and oppor uh, good opportunities and are protected. Uh, they also are a bit, when we talk about the uh, Thomas for a minute, because Thomas has got a problem. He's, he's extremely, he's developed a uh, more, uh, uh, more than a healthy paranoia of, of Hans Davion and uh, House Davion in general. And he's, a pro he's got some problems. Yeah. Uh, borderline paranoic. paranoic uh, Thomas is obsessed with the possibility that Concordia will be attacked by forces in the inner sphere. He has also become increasingly agitated over rumors of foreign agents in the world. As accordingly given greater powers to the Concordia constabulary, he has nevertheless a devoted husband and father, enjoys nothing more than an evening with his wife and five children. Secretly, Thomas would like nothing better than lots of preemptive strike against the inner sphere to turn what he believes is the inevitable invasion of the Concordat. He has not known whether he regards Dave Beyond or House Leal to be the greater threat, although it's been hinted more than enough times uh, across the uh, both Sarn and that and, uh, and various people like myself that uh, his lion's share of his aggression is towards Dave Beyond. And I believe when they do an up the update here, it also brings that up too that it's Dave Beyond that's his prime deal. So, you know, it is what it is. That, my friends, is the Turing Concordia of the Periphery. Uh, I hope to do my next uh, one will be the 3025 version, the uh, Magistrate Canopus, and then the Outworld Alliance, and then we'll do uh, the, the smaller uh, uh, bandit kingdoms and stuff like that individually or in a batch. Uh, and then at some point up the road, I will come back and we will revisit each one of these with the 25 year later update version of them and uh, I've also got on my coming up the pipe for some videos I got my Kel, the Kel Hounds I've got Blood Right which is a mechware uh, uh, game or uh, supplement and Cranston Snorts and Regulars I love these guys they're, they're a hoot and there's a lot more going on there behind the, the table than people want to contribute to anyway this is rick and i hope you guys have a great new year till next time uh i love the comments i love the, the support and appreciation i mean uh, the channel has actually grown quite a bit in the last uh, six months since i started doing BattleTech. i, I don't know but, you know it just is we're just part of it this has never been about a monetary thing i'm never going to get enough people to make any kind of money for anything and i don't have the savvy skills or the technical uh what have you, let alone the time to do really flashy stuff. I mean, if you look at how Texas videos are done, he has a, he has some resources behind him and some cre creative, talented people and the effort to do it. Meanwhile, they still only have a limit to how many videos they put out on a semi-regular basis. Uh, Grim, uh, Grim Dark Narrator puts out a lot of videos. Uh, mostly he's reading verbatim from what's in the books and material sources he's obtained. Uh, so he limits himself to personal opinion. Unlike myself, I can't help that. Uh, that. That is how I am and that's how who I am. Not that I've had anybody complain about it yet. This is my in-depth belief and view of the Battletech universe as I see it and know it and love it. I mean, I'm telling you, uh, I know if I remember I mentioned this once in my very earliest Battletech videos that uh, I was heavy into fastest stuff I I anyway. Uh, I bought all the early Star Trek and I did videos. If you go back far enough on my channel, you'll see all my Star Trek stuff from the FASA era. And um, I was knee deep in something collecting well D, D and something else at that point when i walked in and ivor who was the older gentleman that owned the game store at that time and he says well you, i think you would like this and he pointed to this new he had a display that had about five or six things on there from the, their first early uh, releases of battletech so battletech had just started coming out and uh, i hadn't paid attention to it and then he says hey next thing i, I picked up i don't remember exactly which book i picked up first I, I want to say it was the 3025 uh, uh, technical manual, and, and I think uh, uh, it was uh, uh, House House Liao or House Merrick. I don't remember which. And I went home and I just I consumed them, and then I, I found the novels. He was selling one of the one of the two of the first new novels that came out, and then that just kind of fed my passion for BattleTech. I had a couple friends back then that we got together on the weekends and uh, played 
uh, war games and uh, role playing games quite a lot. Uh, and those were a staple for me in, into uh, the uh, mid 90s. And then, of course, life changes, things change, et cetera, et cetera. So I had the, the, the privilege and the, the foolhardiness to spend a huge amount of my check every week in purchasing all this material when it came out, as it came out, as fast as I could. And yet there was always yet there was always something else. So there were certain scenario or certain collections of stuff I have that kind of came to an end. Uh, BattleTech for me came to an end about 2000 and 2002, and it got I, I, I bought a few things after that. And I, I got we we're getting into the dark ages, and I started and the I, the books started sounding very odd. I didn't like the way that the the, the BattleTech universe had turned and where it was going. And then my resources became extremely limited, so I didn't have the luxury of spending 50, 60 bucks a week in 1990s money. Uh, that would be the equivalent of spending $150 a week on stuff today, considering how much some of these books cost. There's also a dearth of material. I mean, a lot of there's a lot of great game systems. There's such a vast variety of game systems now. Because most of them are created by independents or individuals using Kickstarters and things like this. There's no big, big powerhouses like there was. I mean, I, I go, the GDW is a great example of powerhouse, but they're struggling. They're, they're creating their own demise with some of their attitudes towards their player base, which is foolhardy at best. Anybody that follows Battletech has heard heard that, those stories. Uh, Battletech itself, I, I was out to uh, my, one of my local game stores called Mayhem Comics uh, last uh, last week just to go see, and they have absolutely nothing. There's no Battletech anything on the shelves anywhere, and it was the day before Christmas, and I thought, really? I mean, uh, most of the stuff that Catalyst does, it seems like it reduces it piecemeal in PDF format, which PDF format's great, but the last thing I want is a stack of, uh, 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 well, I don't have the luxury of carrying, a, I don't own a tablet. That's outside my resource ability to support one. And I have a cheap $30 phone I buy to, because of my job it just goes through phones. So I don't have that luxury of being able to sit down and, and then trying to read something on a tiny little screen like this in a PDF format. And there's just something about that. You, these, you can't replace a hard copy. Now, Catalyst has produced a few things. And unfortunately, once again, they're, they seem to have been in limited number. When they came out, I didn't see them. I didn't know about it or I wasn't interested at the time. Now you can't get them. You know, uh, Operation Klondike. I mean, you Google that. Google Operation Klondike. Go to Amazon. And look at what eBay has on them. And there's a few, but they're, they're obscene. They're obscene what they're asking for. Because a couple of smart people bought extras and then and now are reselling them at retarded, you know, 10 times what they, 20 times what they paid for. And if they got a market for that, you know, if I won the lottery tomorrow, I'd be one of them crazy people who would drop a grand to buy an actual hardback, you know, the, the paper version of, printed version of Operation Klondike, for example. But it's not going to happen, so it's not going to happen. And uh, anyway, that's just me ranting for a little bit. You guys have a great year, and uh, we'll be on down with some more great videos and stuff. And uh, spread the word. You know, always enjoy the comments and stuff and any other things that go on. I mean, you know, I can't put everything out uh, on a regular basis. I try, you know, I work at it. I'm still working at it all part of the deal I mean you can see this is just a brief version that book shelf showing this actually runs the entire length of all three of these I just didn't my, my cell phone didn't take them all at once and I've got you know I don't know what 40 50 vital tech novels and most of the box games and stuff that came out back in uh, uh, the 90s and the 80s and 90s and most of, almost all the source book material up until 2002 and I've purchased a few things since then so I still have a lot of stuff to cover plus there are uh, discussion material video worthy things in the uh, collection and, and in, the, in the realm that's worth talking about I mean I've been once again I guess I'm, I'm prolonging this uh, I've been debating about uh, doing a video on uh, why light mechs, you know, light battle mechs, the, the, why they're valuable, more important, why they're as wide, 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 uh, widespread as they are, 
even the smallest of the periphery states, you know, even the smallest of the periphery states that that are out there can, uh, you know, afford to have one more one factory that produces two battle mechs a year. They can produce a light mech. They can get a Stinger or a Wasp or a Locust, and even a Locust on a small level is a game changer for most stuff. But in compare or in 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 tandem with that, my other thing is tanks. And it's always been a hot debate. It, it comes up and down over the over the decades of of why you know battle mechs versus tanks. Uh, tanks have many more limitations than battle mechs, but they are greatly easier to produce. And for even a bandit kingdom of significant size has the opportunity to produce a mechanized combat vehicles if they can acquire the target. You know, they can't produce them the weapons, but they can steal them. They can sure build the vehicle to put them on. Because it's still within the technical realm of most of the inner sphere as of the 3025. Time we get to say 3100, uh, things are changing a little bit. And I think that's why they, they, they did the the uh, uh, the uh, Dark Age thing was to kind of like kick that. They didn't want things to be, we didn't want Star Trek. We didn't want Star Wars. We want some problems with technology and, and the lack of thereof. And so they tried to find a way to reboot it and they did it uh, how they did it. Anyway, this is Rick. Until next time, you guys have a great day and uh, we'll see you then. Huh? <laughs>